Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Klingberg Wing Mark II Development. I'm Rob Klingberg, your host. As you might guess, it's a little warm here in California today. Um, that's why I'm wearing this. Uh, it's actually 100 degrees here in the shop right now. And for those of you overseas, that's degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so we're really cooking. It's not a day to be working with epoxy unless I'm like the flash and I can get it done really fast. So a uh, great day to do some videos instead. If you do see me start to sweat during the video, it's not because I'm uncomfortable with the topic. It's just because it's blistering hot here today. So let's get on with it. And today we're going to start a new series. Uh, we're going to have a new playlist and a new series of videos uh, that have uh, some information that's related to the design that I'm doing, uh, but not directly connected to it. It's kind of a standalone series, and I'm going to discuss uh, topics uh, regarding aerodynamics and structure and so forth on flying wings in general. And uh, as a part of this series, I'm going to try my very best to both dispel uh, misconceptions that people have about flying wings and uh, straighten out uh, some of the knowledge base that's out there, uh, get rid of some old concepts and insert new ones and people that think they know uh, something that's correct and actually it's common knowledge that turns out to be incorrect. Um, and also I'm going to try to break some new ground on uh, addressing issues regarding flying wings and sometimes we're going to get down into just basic aerodynamics and understand try to understand how it actually works so that we can understand flying wings better. Uh, so to start off the series, uh, being the kind of guy that I am, I just decided to dive in at the deep end and we'll take on one of those topics that uh, is seldom discussed. And the people who do talk about it often say, oh, nobody understands that. It's, it hasn't been solved. It's unsolvable. Uh, and, and we don't know why it happens. Uh, and I'm going to take a stab at defining how it happens uh, and the things that we can do to mitigate the problem. Uh, I'm not going to get into an exact solution because I'm not sure one's available. It's an extremely complex topic and I don't think that at this point we can come in and say if you do A, B, C, and D you won't have this problem. But I will be able to address the types of things that we want to avoid doing that might cause the problem to be worse. And that topic is, if you watch the intro, it's called pecking. Uh, now, what is pecking? Uh, some people have heard of it, some people haven't. Think of a chicken uh, eating uh, their meal off the ground, and they go like this. They go boink, 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 boink. Well, that's pecking on a glider or any aircraft. If you're flying along like this, and all of a sudden the nose goes doop, 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 like this, that is a pecking motion. Um, for flying wings, it's not unheard of. Some have it, some do not. It's not clear why some exhibit the characteristic and some do not. Uh, although I hope by the end of this video, it's a little bit clearer as to why that might be happening and the things that we can do to avoid it. Now, I don't know of any cases of a flying wing being lost or crashing because of pecking, uh, but there have been some severe cases of it. Uh, the SB-13, I'll put a picture up here uh, of it, and uh, it is well known to have had issues with pecking and the pecking problem there was exacerbated by some aeroelastic problems, the flexibility of the wings, uh, making it uh, quite a complex problem. Uh, the Horton brothers, some of their designs had pecking issues, some did not. Uh, it's said that it is unknown as to why one would have it and the other one would not. My original wing, put a picture of it up here, uh, did experience pecking motions. In fact, I flew some flights where I had pecking occur. Uh, and it was so fast, it went through those cycles, it'd go through three or four cycles, go one, two, three, four, and it's over. And by the time I realized it was pecking, it was over. Uh, it is so fast that you don't even have a chance to move the controls before it damps out and it's gone. And it disappears almost as fast as it appears. And it's not frightening, but it's disconcerting because as a pilot, you're sitting there and you look around and you go, what the heck was that? And it's like, wow, I didn't even have a chance to correct for it. Well, it's over and you keep flying the flight. Um, and uh, it comes and goes seemingly without cause or without reason. 
And uh, as you're flying this aircraft, you think, well, I'm glad it's not any worse, because if that got bad, I'd be in big trouble. I'd have to deploy the parachute. So it could become a real problem. And uh, it's not something uh, that we need to go to great lengths to solve, but we need to be aware of it. We need to create designs that will avoid the issue. Because to the pilot, it's at the very least disconcerting. And at the worst, distracts him from the other flying uh, activities that he should be doing at that point. Uh, you know, you don't want to be concentrating on other traffic in the thermal that you're in, and all of a sudden your glider starts doing this. Uh, it's just going to distract you at the world's worst time. So let's delve into the pecking topic and see if we can define where it comes from and how we might avoid it in the future. Okay, so uh, let me grab a book here that some of you may have seen, may not have seen. Uh, let's see, what's the title of this? Tailless Aircraft in Theory and Practice. Uh, I believe that this book is out of print. Uh, I had to get this copy out of Europe. I managed to find a new copy on Amazon. Uh, I think they had two or three copies left. If you endeavor to design flying wings, you got to have a copy of this book. It is loaded with great information. Now, it has been translated. Some of the writing is a little stiff, uh, it can be hard to get through technically. It can be hard to get through in terms of uh, the cleanliness of the uh, language being used uh, and just the arrangement of the book. It's a little bit chaotic, but it is chock-a-block full of important information. And if you design flying wings, you should have a copy of this book. Look on Amazon. You might be able to find a copy of it. Uh, and regardless of what it costs, I, I, what did I pay for this? Did I pay 80 bucks for this, something like that maybe? Uh, I would say anything under 200 bucks, buy it. It's well worth it. Okay, so uh, in, this, uh, in the book on page 104, I'm going to read you a little bit of the text from the book here uh, where they address where, uh, the t chapters on stability, and they finally get down to the pecking issue here. Uh, many flying wing uh, documents and books and so forth won't even touch on the topic, but they did here. Uh, and they talk about the Horton brothers and the SB-13 and so forth. And they get down to here and it says, now this book was written in the 90s, so some time has passed and we know a little bit more now than we used to. But in the 90s, they said, up to now, pecking is not fully understood. It still remains a mystery uh, and is perhaps the last, question mark, unsolved problem of some flying wings. Theoretical research and flight tests are urgently required. Now, uh, the research work, there's not too many people doing that because there's not a lot of call for flying wing designs. And in terms of flight tests, almost non-existent. Uh, in terms of somebody like me that's building a foot launch sailplane like this, that's a flying wing, when we go out and test it, I'm not going to collect data on pecking. I'm not going to load this thing up full of instruments and try to collect data on the pitching motion of the aircraft and see if I can figure out where that pecking's coming from. Uh, my goals are such that that's unimportant to me. I think I've created a design that's going to help avoid the pecking. But here you have a bunch of engineers writing this book, people who have flown fl a lot of flying wings, people who have designed them and says, hey, we don't get it, we don't understand it, and as far as we know, there aren't any equations, there's no math, there's no specific path to go down to say, if I do this with the design, uh, it won't have this pecking problem. So, unsolved problem. Am I going to solve it in this video? Probably not. Uh, am I going to be able to provide some guidance as to how to avoid it? I hope so. Uh, and given the series of videos that I'm doing, uh, this is another one of those perfect videos for people to write in and tell me I'm wrong and why I'm wrong. And uh, there'll be some trolls out there who want to just spin me up, but uh, don't worry, that's okay. I just ignore them. Uh, and there'll be other people that are just totally confused and I don't even understand why you're going on and on about this pecking issue. Uh, but it is an important topic and something that we should endeavor to avoid. So let's dive in by, first of all, understanding the difference between static stability and dynamic stability. Now, I'm going to get my whiteboard up here, and it's got some graphs on it and so forth, but no equations. We're going to try to keep this simple so everybody can understand it, and we'll begin to describe the two different types of stability. Okay, I think I have this. Let's see if I can avoid all the lighting here and so forth. You're picking up some of the studio lights there, uh, but I think I got you in view here. And let me reach across the screen here and get my pointer. Okay, let's understand the basic difference between static stability and dynamic stability. 
Static stability is exactly what its name says. It's static. It's non-moving. A pyramid sitting on the ground, statically stable. A pyramid sitting on its pointy top on the ground, unstable. It's going to fall over. That's because the center of gravity of that pyramid's up here, and as soon as it goes past that point, as soon as that center of gravity wanders either side past that point, it's going to fall over. Center of gravity's down here, and it can't move because we're secure here and we're secure here. It just sits there. It's stable. Static stability in terms of flying wings, very easy to predict. There's equations for that, and how you configure a flying wing to be statically stable is well known. And just about anybody can do it. You can pick up a book, tell you how to do it, follow those instructions, and you'll have a statically stable flying wing. In fact, most designers of model flying wings, that's all the further that they ever get. Uh, once you get into dynamic stability, it gets so complicated, they don't even go there. Um, and also, most um, hang gliders are only addressed in terms of static stability. Uh, they don't get into dynamic stability. Most hang gliders... Uh, are not even analyzed uh, in terms of the design. They are starting to be now, but in the past it was mostly cut and try and test fly. And if you had something that handled nice and was safe, that's what you went with. Uh, and formal analysis wasn't really done. Uh, many of the characteristics of flex wings that we have today, which fly fantastically, uh, we can historically know how we got there, but the math that's behind it and the engineering behind it it's kind of unknown. It's starting to come around, though. It hasn't been studied on a formal basis. So this is where most people get. Easy to predict, static stability. I got a flying wing that flies. However, when it comes down to the handling of the aircraft, how nice is it to fly? Uh, how pilot amenable is it? How safe is it? It comes down to dynamic stability. And this is a very complex topic for any aircraft and for flying wings it's pretty much an area that's unknown, very little known about it. But let's look at just what the basics are of what dynamic stability means. Dynamic stability is the action of that aircraft over time. What is it doing over a certain time span? If it stays at one angle of attack, fly state doesn't move other than forward, it's dynamically steady. It's not pitching up or down, not rolling and it's moving forward. However, that's hardly ever the case. When we fly, we're in the air, and we're bouncing around, and we're rolling, and we're pitching, and we're moving forward, and we're yawing, doing all kinds of things. <laughs> in fact, it's often said, if you couldn't see air, you wouldn't fly in it, uh, because it's not this magical, smooth thing that we create on the chalkboards when we uh, talk about aerodynamics. It's actually very, very turbulent. So uh, dynamic stability is uh, the action of aircraft over a period of time. So now let's talk about pitch because that's our uh, interest today with the pecking. And suppose we went along and we're flying along and the nose went down and came back up and stopped. We did a half cycle and stops. Well, that's highly damped in terms of pitching. And damping is, uh, are the forces that are present and the tendency of the aircraft to return to a, a stasis point uh, where you're back to steady flight and you're no longer oscillating. And if you do that in a high, half a cycle, that's this. Dip down and back up and you're highly damped in terms of uh, dynamic pitch stability. If the motion continues without any change in amplitudes, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, no pilot inputs, mind you, up and down, up and down, you are neutrally stable dynamically. It's not getting worse, it's not getting better, and you're up and down and up and down. If you have this other case where the amplitude gets bigger, you know, you start out small, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, then you're in trouble. Uh, because unless you're quick enough on the stick and catch one of those pulses just at the right time to stop it, it's going to keep doing that until it diverges and either flips over or disintegrates structurally or something like that. This is really bad. Um, I don't know of any cases of flying wings getting into this. It may have happened. Might have happened with the Northrop uh, bomber that went in. I think that was a stall spin accident, but maybe some of this was involved. We don't know. Uh, there were no uh, data recorders on that flight. So we definitely want to avoid this because that could be deadly. 
Uh, this we want to avoid because it's massively annoying. And, and this one is somewhat acceptable. Uh, if it's a half cycle, not a problem, and the pilot can just ignore it. Now, this one annoys the pilot and makes it an unpleasant aircraft to fly. This one over here apparently happened with the SB-13, and it was connected in with air elasticity of the wings. As the wing flexes in flight, the loads change, the pitching moments change, the lift changes, uh, and the arrangement of the lift centers and drag centers, they all move relative to each other. It's a really dynamic system. And what happens is, is you can actually get a coupling of motions. And uh, the flexing of the wings up and down can couple with the pecking motion and make it worse and worse and worse. And I've read that that happened with the SP-13. And they went back and tried to stiffen the wings. And apparently it helped somewhat, but it didn't fix all of the problems. Uh, so a pecking issue there with that aircraft. My first wing, it was, my first wing was like this. It would peck, but in three or four cycles it would damp out. In fact, so fast you wouldn't have a chance to correct for it. The problem with trying, with this type of situation is the pilot might try to correct. It's going along like this, it's oscillating, it's not damping out, and the pilot's going to try to catch one of those. Usually, human beings are out of sync with this type of motion. It's usually occurring faster than we can respond to. And not only that, you have to be ahead of the curve, as they say. You have to be correcting. It might be here, but you need to be correcting up here. Um, you need to be predicting when it's going to get there. Pilots are very bad about predicting when it's good to, going to get to a particular point. Like, the mo nose might be coming up, and intuitively, you want to put the stick forward, get the nose back down, but actually, it might the signs of all of the forces may have changed, and when the nose is coming up, might be just the perfect time to pull further back on the stick and stop that next down cycle. You don't know. And this is where we get into PIO, pilot-induced oscillations, where the pilot tries to fix the problem and ends up making it worse. And the pilot can literally move it from this mode to this mode. And um, on the flying wings that have had uh, pecking problems, that didn't damp out in three quick cycles and go away before you notice them, the course of action for the pilot was to let go of the stick, to literally don't allow yourself any chance of giving any inputs and let the aircraft damp itself out. Um, and to tell a pilot, being a pilot myself, be a very hard thing to buy into. Oh, my aircraft is oscillating and I'm supposed to let go of the stick. What are you, out of your mind? Uh, I, I got to fix the problem. So, this type of situation uh, can lead to this quite rapidly, and, and that's a bad situation. So we definitely want to avoid designing aircraft that do this. So uh, if you have pecking that damps out pretty quick, we might be able to live with it, but we prefer to avoid it because we have another problem that's coming in here, and that has to do with turbulence that, that's in the air. Suppose you're going along and, and bouncing along like this, somehow you got going, and, and you hit a gust, and it makes it worse. And you hit another gust, and it makes it worse. Well, that's a problem. We want something that either the pilot can damp out quickly or just doesn't happen in the first place. So this could be a risky spot to be in. And in fact, when I experienced it in my wing, I thought, oh, that's not good. That's bad. I'm going to have to find some way to fix that. Uh, unfortunately, the aircraft was lost in a, in a stall spin accident uh, before ever had to, ever got into the region of addressing this particular issue. Now, um, with dynamic uh, instabilities or dynamic stability, uh, there are a few ways to actually uh, cause it to happen. The ability to perturb. And I see I have to pull this up a little bit higher here, and I'm going to set it on top of my D-tube mold here so you can see it. Let's see if that balances out. I think you can see that. We'll try not to damage anything. The ability to perturb the wing. And uh, in order for a dynamic stability problem to come into effect, you have to perturb the flight path. And that can be done in a variety of ways. That can be turbulence in the air. Uh, you can hit a gust, nose can dip or go up, and you get an oscillation going. Um, and I'm going to loop back to this subfactor here. It can be control inputs. The pilot can go boop, like this and get it started. Or it's a slower motion, you know. He could go something like this and, and get, it, get it going. Um, and then uh, mass distributions. If you're on a flex wing where the pilot can move, or any situation where the pilot can move and change the mass distribution of the aircraft, you might be able to perturb some dynamic event. 
And then there's the ability to damp it out. Uh, there's inherent damping in the design of the aircraft. The aircraft is designed such that the pitching moment curves, uh, lift curves, the rigidity of the structure of the aircraft are all designed to uh, damp out any dynamic instabilities. And then there's active. And active can come about in uh, a couple of different ways. It can be the pilot on the control stick uh, giving control commands to stop that oscillation. Those generally don't work out well. Usually the pilot is too slow. And the other active system would be active flight controls, fly-by-wire, uh, computer-controlled uh, damping of the system. And that's what aircraft like the B-2 bomber use. Uh, put a picture up here. Uh, B-2 bombers, inherently unstable aircraft, so is the F-117. And they use active flight controls to damp out dynamic instabilities because they're fast enough to do that job. Um, now, uh, back with turbulence, uh, there is this thing called characteristic length. When we study turbulence relative to the aerodynamics of aircraft, uh, we talk about characteristic length. And for uh, I won't go into too much depth on that, but it basically has to do with the size of the gust area. And there's certain parameters on the amount of the gust in the middle compared to the edges and how you size this and what determines the characteristic length. But the characteristic length is very important, as well as the amplitude of the gust, how much and how big of an area. So you could have a really, really tiny gust that's very forceful and just bops you on the nose, but it might, might not be big enough to, to, to affect a large enough surface on the aircraft to perturb it much. Or you could have a huge characteristic length, but the amplitude is tiny, and the aircraft is so heavy it just flies right through. It's a big flying wing bomber, just goes right through that turbulence, no problem. With our hang gliders or ultralight aircraft, we quite often run into turbulence, which has a characteristic length and an amplitude that is a perfect combination for disturbing our flight path dynamically, especially in pitch. So with flying wings, not uncommon. Flying wings that are ultralight or sailplanes, not uncommon to run into uh, turbulence that will cause the pecking to get started. So uh, now, what else can I tell you about this? Uh, you know, there's not too many people in the world, there's a few of us, who have flown a lot of flying wings. There, I, I've flown rigid flying wings, I've flown flex flying wings, and I've flown dozens and dozens of models, some of my own design and some of other people's designs. And I've only run into the pecking problem once, personally, and that was on my original flying wing. Uh, so my conclusion is it doesn't show up very often, uh, but it is a problem that needs to be addressed. And the interesting thing is, is I've never seen it show up on a model. And uh, usually the pecking is a very low amplitude. Uh, in the, I have video of the flight in my original wing where I experienced the pecking from behind. And you can't see it at all in the video. Yet it was very easy for me to see. I'm sitting right here in the middle of the wing, and the wing, uh, i got to get it up here. Imagine that the wing's up here, but it's down at my waist, and I'm watching, and it goes doop, 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 like this. And it's like, wow, I, I didn't move at all. I just sitting there steady, and the wing just does this. Um, so... I, and I have a lot of video on uh, models flying, video camera right on the model. I never see pecking show up. Uh, so my first guess is pecking is directly interconnected with the characteristic length of the turbulence, characteristic length and the amplitude of the turbulence. And models, because they're so small, turbulence is really large compared to a model. So the, the model flies into the turbulence and it goes up and it goes down, but the turbulence is so large it doesn't have a chance to perturb just the nose before the tail's into the turbulence. You just, you're flying into it and it goes up and it goes down. It's a whole aircraft event as opposed to just on the nose, just on the nose or just on the tail or just on a wing tip. Interesting. So that's probably why we don't see it on models. So flying a model around and saying, hey, it doesn't pack, problem solved, probably a false conclusion. So if you're doing a model of your design that you're planning on making at full scale, the fact that the model doesn't experience pecking probably tells you nothing. Uh, so you can't go by that. Okay, so far in the uh, video on pecking, we've discussed uh, uh, the basics of static stability and dynamic stability and what some of the causes might be for perturbing an aircraft and getting it into a mode where it's pecking like this. Um, and one of the things that I've talked about uh, was a little bit of detail so far as the uh, characteristic length and amplitude of the turbulence that's in the air. That's an interesting topic and it helps us understand uh, the perturbation 
of the pecking motion. Uh, but when it comes down to designing an aircraft, <laughs> there's not anything we can do about it. We can't go out and change the atmosphere. Uh, that's certainly not going to happen. Now, we could placard the aircraft against flying in heavy turbulence, uh, but if you're a soaring aircraft, that kind of obviates the purpose of the whole thing. Uh, we have to go out and fly in turbulence. Uh, it's the nature of the sport. Um, so not much we can do in terms of uh, designing or restricting uh, around turbulence. So uh, we have to live with that factor, and we have to focus on those things that we can control. Now, one of the easiest things to do to where we get all that we want in terms of our design uh, and yet avoid a problem is to try to control the pilot. In other words, we teach the pilot to fly a particular aircraft in a particular way so as to not cause the problem. And for some situations, this is actually fairly easy to do. Uh, in other situations, no. Uh, you tell the pilot, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, don't do a loop. Uh, don't do aerobatics in your glider. And sure, shoot, and there's somebody out there going, that <laughs> designer doesn't know what he's talking about. This thing's going to loop just fine. And he goes and does a loop, and he rips the wing off. You know, it's like, well, I told you not to do that. Um, so, uh, the human factor is not a precise control methodology. Um, and in some cases, it does work where it's some innocuous thing. Like, well, the first time I flew a V-tail Bonanza, uh, I was all over the sky in yaw. I'm just wandering, wandering, wandering. It's like, wow, I thought I knew how to fly airplanes. Um, and it turns out that there's a long fugoid mode in yaw on the V-tail Bonanza, and it happens to sync up just about right with the pilot's reaction time, such that when you see the nose swing left, and you go, uh-oh, nose is starting to wander to the left, and you tromp on the right rudder pedal, that's the exact wrong thing to do. Because the uh, motion has already changed signs. Uh, the sign of the mathematics has already switched to the other direction. But as a pilot, you don't know that yet, because you haven't sensed the motion. Uh, in fact, there might not be any appreciable motion at all going back the other way. But all of the forces have changed, and it's already headed back to the right. So by the time you tromp on that right rudder pedal, you just make the problem worse. And it's a little hard to learn at first, a little disconcerting. But as soon as the nose begins to swing left on that VTL Bonanza, you just tap the left rudder pedal, the exact opposite of what you would think would be the right thing to do, and that nose will swing back to center and just stop right there. And the first time it happens, you go, Wow, that's really weird, but it's cool, and I understand it now. And then you just become second nature, and you fly the aircraft that way. For dynamic problems that occur with flying wings, having something like that, not only highly unlikely to be able to resolve it with a pilot, but also too risky uh, in that we, we deploy aircraft that uh, don't have another pilot on board to, to help with the problem, and uh, a group of pilots that tend to uh, not read the instructions and go and just fly the aircraft anyway. So we need to design aircraft that are inherently safe to fly, regardless of what people do with them. So now we're down to working with parameters that we can actually control. And that has to do with the design of the aircraft. And we can control the aerodynamics of the aircraft. We can control the mass distribution of the aircraft. And we can control the controls the effect that the controls have. And those are all design things, levers that we can pull and, and try to uh, avoid problems. So now, uh, with the pecking motion, yeah, it's obviously a pitch problem. Uh, so that's an elevator thing. And uh, it has to do with pitching moments, right? Every airfoil has its own pitching moment. The, the force, uh, the tendency of the airfoil to go down or to go up. Um, so that's obviously an important parameter. And the biggest impact that we can have on pitching moment, because it's kind of inherent uh, in the airfoil, is the airfoil selection. We can change airfoil selections to change the nature of the pitching moment curve, which would obviously be a driving parameter in, in this pitch damping scenario. Depending upon what the inherent pitching moment is of that airfoil, could make it worse, could make it better. So airfoil selection. Uh, we can also adjust the washout in the wing. Uh, that means that we have a changing pitching moment as we go out along the wing. The airfoils in the center have one pitching moment, and the airfoils at the tip that are nose down like this, they have a different pitching moment. Uh, and they sum up at the aerodynamic, uh, mean aerodynamic quarters where they essentially sum up at. 
So we can change the washout, and if we change the washout, increase it, where those uh, pitching moments average out changes positions on the semi-span, and that changes the moment arm relative to the uh, neutral point or the aerodynamic center of the aircraft. So you can play with that one. Uh, is that a strong factor? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, and when I say I don't know, it's not a lead into something else. I really don't know. Uh, I haven't played with that much myself. Uh, we can play with the mass distributions. Uh, if you've ever had a long stick with a weight on the end of it, and if you put the weight really close to your hand, oh, it's super easy to move that stick up and down. But if it's a big heavy weight like a sledgehammer, and you've got that big head out there at the end of the sledgehammer, oh, it's much harder to swing it up and down. And the key here is that if the mass distribution is spread out from the pivot point, it's harder to get motion initiated it's also harder to make it stop. So any damping forces that you have available to you are less effective when the mass distribution is a long ways away from the center of rotation. So we want to keep our mass distributions, generally speaking, as close to the point of rotation as possible so that our damping forces can be effective. Now, there's a trade-off here. As you bring them in closer, well, it's easier to perturb the aircraft. If something, uh, if I have a big heavy nose weight on my aircraft and the pivot points back here and I run into turbulence, well, the turbulence is not going to be as effective moving the aircraft up and down. And that's true. That's like the B-2 bomber, Northrop flying wing bomber. Very hard to perturb them in pitch because they're massive. Very hard to move them. Uh, what their mass distributions are, I don't know, uh, but more massive. Now, we're flying gliders. More massive? Probably not an answer. I'm not going to go hang 50 pounds of weight at the nose of my glider just to make it harder to perturb in flight. So that's a non-answer uh, in that direction. But we need to be cognizant of the mass distributions and what they're going to do to us. Uh, another way of looking at this would be the figure skater. It's the common explanation you always hear. You know, they, uh, as they put their arms out like this, their spin slows down. As they pull their arms in, they spin faster. So that's a control of mass distribution, uh, another way of looking at the problem. We can control the aerial, aerial elasticity of the system. How flexible is the wing? Because we've talked about how that could, the motion of the wing bending could actually couple in with uh, the problem and make it worse. So generally speaking, the stiffer the structure, the better off you are. Now, with lightweight aircraft, that's usually pretty easy to achieve. As our aircraft go lighter, as we go more towards ultralight aircraft, generally the airframes become stiffer. And that's because by the time we design the airframe strong enough to take the static bending loads under high G conditions, we end up with a really stiff structure. If you have heavy aircraft and you design them to be strong enough to take the static bending loads under G's, those are generally more flexible structures. And you'll see this in high-performance sailplanes. High-performance sailplanes might weigh hundreds of pounds. They could weigh over 1,000 pounds. And they have carbon fiber wings. And you see them flex all the time. They flex up and down. They flex in flight. They flex when they land, bounce, 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 up and down. And uh, they're designed to accept that flexibility without breaking. Um, but that does make them more susceptible to flutter, uh, which is the problem of the oscillation of the wing up and down getting coupled in with other motions of the aircraft. And I, I have with me here in the shop a very simple plain flying wing. I'll back up a little bit for you, uh, also known as a sheet of balsa. Um, and if we think of uh, this as the nose of our flying wing, and, and this is the wing, and it's swept back like this, well, when we're flying along, and I'm going to point it down so you can see it here, uh, but actually we're flying horizontal, and because it's just a thin little sheet, you won't see it. So here we are, we're swept back, and as the wing bends up like this, because it's swept back, it also twists like this. So we're getting additional washout in the wing and bending, and now it wants to go back down this way. And then you get wash in, and you get a higher angle of attack, and your lift increases out at the tip, and up she goes again, and then it twists the other way, and you decrease the lift, and back down it goes again. And as you go through this, you're imparting 
uh, both um, dynamic loads into the aircraft just due to the bending. It's bent up like this. And if both wings are bent up, if both wings are bent up and it's swept back, you're wanting to push the nose down. And if the wing's bent down, it's trying to twist that nose back up. And if you're already pecking and the wings start doing this, you got a problem on your hands. So really stiff structure, Re as stiff as we can possibly make it without going overweight. That's something that we can do to perhaps prevent pecking. We can also address issues of not letting pecking get started. Now, we can't avoid the turbulence, but maybe we can design the aircraft such that it's very hard to perturb the aircraft. And that's that mass distribution that I'm talking about. So that's another avenue that we can look at for stopping pecking, is dealing with the mass distribution such that I don't make the aircraft heavier, but I do arrange my masses in such a way that I make it harder to perturb the aircraft. So we've identified three areas that we can actually work with to uh, avoid pecking. And I'm not saying guaranteeing it doesn't happen, no. I'm saying doing things that will lessen the likelihood of having pecking. So that would be uh, the aerodynamics, mostly the selection of the airfoil because it has the pitching moment in it, which is a damping driver. Um, the stiffness of the wing so that we don't get any coupling between the wing flapping up and down and the pitching moments and everything else that's contributing to the damping or the excitation of the motion and uh, mass distributions to help uh, reduce the propensity for the design to be perturbed in the first place. Well, here we are in the middle of the video. And you probably noticed that the, uh, the background lighting here has changed uh, significantly. It used to be very bright back there and now it's dark. So there I was uh, in the uh, den slash shop editing video and realized, oh my God, I forgot an entire segment of the topic uh, about how to improve the pitch damping of the aircraft, the methods that can be used to increase the pitch damping so that we don't run into this pecking problem. And uh, there's, there's two other factors that a designer has to consider. And, and I'll get my handy dandy flying wing, my semi-span back out here to explain this because it has the appropriate flexibility uh, to do this. Um, one way that you can uh, deal with uh, increasing the pitch damping is to increase the sweep angle. And I'm going to tilt this up once again. So we would have a shallow sweep like this, or we could go back here and have a very steep sweep angle. In fact, delta wings are a special case of flying wing that has a lot of sweep. If you go, sweep is usually measured at the quarter cord, so if you measure at the quarter cord, uh, the sweep of a delta wing is pretty high compared to uh, a lot of our gliders, flex wings or other rigid wings. Uh, the B-2 bomber is an example of a delta wing. A lot of people don't recognize it as a delta wing, but it really is. Uh, it's a delta wing with a bunch of notches out of the trailing edge, and those notches are taken out of there for the signature technology reasons or stealth. Um, but it's essentially a highly swept flying wing. That's essentially a delta wing. As far as I know, uh, there aren't any uh, significant articles or any recorded data on there being a lot of uh, pecking issues with delta wings, and that's because they're highly damped and it's because they're highly swept like this. Now, what does sweep have to do with damping? Well, here's one way to look at it. If my wing is like this, if it's straight, and the pitch is in this direction like this, if my pitching is up and down like this, well, there's very little aerodynamic damping this way. I can take this thing like this and I can go boop, 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 and there's nothing to stop me. There's no significant forces preventing me from pitching the wing up and down. However, if it's highly swept, here's the leading edge, here's the nose, way back here at the tip of the wing, so pitching would be in this direction. So that's this motion. And you can see what that does to the balsa here. It causes it to bend up and down. And the reason it's bending up and down is because that there's significant forces out here. When I try to go up, there's a force down. When I try to go down, there's a force up. And those are aerodynamic forces that are generated because of the motion of the wing as it goes through the pecking cycles. So a highly swept wing will be much less, uh, uh, will have much less tendency to have this pecking problem. 
and delta wings are just a special case of flying wing that's highly swept. So you can increase sweep. Now, uh, on our gliders uh, or other aircraft where we want uh, high performance from our flying wing, we don't want a lot of sweep. You get a lot of spanwise flow. It's highly inefficient. And it's really not a good answer for soaring aircraft. So why do we have delta wings? Why is the B-2 bomber essentially a delta wing? Why do we have other fighter aircraft that are delta wings? Well, uh, they provide several advantages in other areas. If you're on an aircraft carrier and you can get this highly swept wing that has a very short span but lots of wing area, well, that's good. Fit a lot of them on an aircraft carrier. There are other uh, factors of delta wings which come in very handy. Uh, the vortex that curls up on the leading edge. You get the high angles of attack. You get this vortex curling up. You get vortex lift that really slow you up for landing. Um, stealth aircraft. You want that leading edge highly swept. So when the radar comes in this way, the reflected beam goes out that way. You're not reflecting the beam back to the radar that's looking for that return. You send the return somewhere else. So, and no, I'm not giving away any stealth secrets there. You can go on Wikipedia and read the same stuff. Um, so uh, there are reasons for delta wings that are very advantageous. But in terms of a soaring aircraft, delta wing, bad answer. So what's another way uh, that I forgot to cover earlier <laughs> on how to increase pitch damping? Well, let me put up a picture here. Let's see, where do I have room? Let's see, if I move over a little bit here, I will have room. Let's see, use the right arm over here because I have to think in reverse. My little monitor here is in reverse. So I'll put a picture up over here, and uh, there it is. Now there's a hang glider uh, that's a flying wing with a tail. Is it a flying wing? has a tail. Does the tail mean that it's not a flying wing? I don't know. How do you define a flying wing? My flying wing has vertical stabilizers. Does that mean it's not a flying wing? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you to decide. But on some of these rigid wings that have come out and some other designs, we see these small horizontal tails show up back on the tailbone. And putting the a little bit of surface area, pretty small, this this much by this much, you stick it back on the tail boom, that will drastically increase pitch damping. And that's because essentially what you've done is you've taken the highly swept wing case, I took this part of the wing back here, put it on a tail boom, and when the thing wants to pitch up and down, that tail is trying to sweep up and down through the air. And it's going through these high angles of attack, generating a lot of lift and drag, and it damps you out. So to get that pitch damping from that little tail back there, we pay a price in terms of drag. And we pull the tail around with us all the time. Most of the time, it's very close to zero angle of attack. It's only generating parasite drag. But if we do get into a pitch oscillation, the tail does its job and damps out that oscillation, and we pay a little penalty in drag. And for this type of design, it's not a bad answer. It's a good compromise. In fact, it is my backup option. If I have problems with pecking with my current design, I have a tail boom on it. I can very easily bond on an extension uh, to that tail boom, put a small tail on it. And the way that I have all my transportation uh, ideas set up, I, I can put a tail on there that's up to three and a half feet wide, uh, three and a half feet of span, and put a nice little cord on it, make it very thin section so there's not much drag, and give myself a lot of pitch damping uh, if need be. So you can't change the sweep of your design in the middle of testing, unless you have a variable geometry aircraft, but you can easily add a small tail back there. Does that mean it's not a flying wing? I don't know. It does change the aesthetics of the design. And I like the aesthetics of my aircraft the way that it is now without a small tail back there. But I will put a small tail on if I need to to increase the pitch damping. So everybody that's considering their design of a flying wing, you might want to plan ahead and figure out some way of, if I need to, can I put a small tail back there and provide more pitch damping? It's a very important thing to keep in mind as you go through your design. So now we go back to the rest of the discussion. So let's look at the first one first. And I'm gonna, I, I've changed my board here. I'm going to bring it back up. I'm going to put this back up on the table and let me fiddle with this, make sure that you can see it. And we're going to talk about these two charts at the top here. This chart is pitching moment versus angle of attack. And this chart over here is the coefficient of lift versus angle of attack. Pitching moment is what we're interested in. 
Now the data here, and I hope you can see them, were generated with a program called XFOIL. And XFOIL is known to be fairly accurate, certainly very good for comparison purposes and uh, good for what we're doing here. Now, I've uh, done a run of three different airfoils here. Here's a NACA 0012. That's a fully symmetrical section. Let me get that in view. The NACA 23012, that's the airfoil that I use on my flying wing uh, on some of the sections, most of them actually. And then the NACA 2412. And you can go look those up, Google it under images, and it'll pop up those airfoils, and you'll see what they look like. But these are airfoils of increasing camber. The mean camber line increases for each one of these airfoils. This airfoil would have been typical for what was used on the Northrop flying wing, I believe. I believe they actually used a fully symmetrical but laminar flow wing section, I think. Uh, this is what I used on my first wing. I used the 23018 at the root and the uh, 0015 at the tip. So I had an airfoil that had behavior somewhere between these two. And the NACA 2412 is not too far off of what your standard flex wing would use. And you can see each one of these the, has an each one has an increasing, as you increase the mean camber line of the airfoil, or the camber of the airfoil, you increase the nose down pitching moment. It has more of a tendency to pitch nose down. Now, for flying wings, generally, we don't like a strong nose down pitching moment because that means we have to put more washout in the wing. Now, you can get a fully symmetrical airfoil flying wing to fly with very little washout, two degrees, three degrees. You probably make it statically stable and fly that way. With my airfoil, it tends to work out or the NACA 23O series, the ones that I use, it turns out you need somewhere between six and 10 degrees of washout. And I quite commonly use eight. It seems to work out well. And uh, for the airfoils that are used for flex wings, flex wings quite often have 10, 12, 14 degrees of washout. They have a lot of washout. And their washout varies. As the aircraft is loaded and the wing twists, the washout changes considerably. Um, why do flex wings use such a lousy airfoil in terms of pitching moment? Well, uh, that's a historical thing. Uh, as we went from uh, standard regala wings that had no battens, and then we had battens that were flexible, pieces of plastic, uh, but they were generally flat, and then we went to the aluminum battens that were shaped. Somebody says, I, I got to... And you got to understand how hang gliders were designed and built then. There's a guy out in his garage saying, I'm going to put in... Uh, battens that have an airfoil shape and I'll get more performance. That'll work great. And, and he's right. And, and he's looking around and going, I, I got to bend this aluminum tubing. And literally, here's what happened. They took a tire. <laughs> a guy took a tire and said, oh, the rubber's got just about the right amount of give to it. And here's my half inch diameter, a quarter inch diameter aluminum tube. Oh, look, and it bends right around this tire and I bend it this far and then it springs back and I got a curved section and a straight section and that's my airfoil. And that airfoil ends up being pretty close to the 2412. And believe it or not, to this day, many hang gliders are manufactured. They have a jig in the shop. It's plywood. It's a circular jig. And they bend the tubing around that thing. It's not like anybody came in and said, I want this airfoil. I want to send my tubing out to a shop and have it bent exactly to that shape. It's not how it happened. So that's where they are where they are. It, it, it's just a path that they followed down and still exists to this day. Um, an interesting little piece of historical uh, information there. So what's the main thing that we notice about these pitching moment curves? Well, the NACA 0012, the symmetrical section, has a pitching moment of zero at zero degrees angle of attack. There's no nose down, there's no nose up pitching moment. And as you change angle of attack, its pitching moment changes. Initially, the pitching moment goes positive, nose up, and then right out here at about five degrees, I think it is, yeah, five degrees, that begins to switch and it goes down to a nose down pitching moment and then it swings back up again. And we notice that this phenomena occurs for every airfoil, that as we go through our angle of attack, the pitching moment actually changes. And because that pitching moment is changing at different angles of attack, well, that could certainly impact our pecking problem. Because in certain flight regimes, we have this pitching moment. And in other flight regimes, we have another pitching moment. And the pilot is automatically adjusting for these changes with the elevator or his weight shift. So he's accommodating these changes in pitching moment with slight adjustments in the control system. And we notice another phenomenon here, that as we change the camber of the airfoil, no camber, slight camber, much more camber, the point at which this change in pitching moment occurs shifts towards a lower angle of attack. 
And here's an interesting thing that I've found out in studying these curves. A symmetrical airfoil flying wing, when you, by the time you get done with the whole design and get something set up that's statically stable and flyable, <laughs> believe it or not, you're flying pretty much right in the middle of this regime of this switching of pitchy moment curve. And the same thing's true of my flying wing. Both of them exist in this regime right here. However, with flex wings, they're just outside of it. They usually trim. Their trim angle of attack is somewhere up here. So they have a, first of all, they have a much more predictable uh, pitching moment uh, uh, coefficient. Uh, it, it, the, excuse me. They have a pitching moment coefficient that's much more predictable and much better behaved. With these configurations, not so much. But believe it or not, pitching moment is not a huge driver on this problem. Uh, it really isn't. It drives it a little bit, but it, it's a secondary factor. I wouldn't say it's tertiary, but it's a secondary factor. So at least we need to be cognizant of, oh, the airfoil I selected and the angle of attack that I plan on trimming at, I'm going to trim at five degrees, puts me right in the middle of that regime. If I had a symmetrical airfoil, I'd be at the beginning of it. If I had a flex wing, oh, I'm outside of it. Okay, so my particular design is flying in a regime where that pitching moment curve or uh, cofactor, uh, the pitching moment coefficient is a little less predictable. Very interesting. Um, does that mean I'm going to go change my airfoil, go to symmetrical, or go to something that's much more cambered? No, because I will take a significant ding on overall performance if I change my airfoil. So I got to figure out something else instead. I'm not going to change my airfoil. I'm going to have to figure out how to make an aircraft that's flyable in this portion of the pitching moment curve. And just as an aside, I thought I'd print out the lift coefficients. And you can see this pitching moment phenomena show up in the lift uh, curve slope. Uh, here is symmetrical. Here's my airfoil. Here's the uh, flex wing airfoil. And they, right here, you see for the different Reynolds numbers, you see a divergence of the lift data right about where this is occurring. So uh, the phenomena is consistent. It's predictable and uh, it impacts our lift curve slopes also, but not to a significant degree. But it does have a significant impact on pitching mode. So that's something to stay aware of when we design our flying wings, as to what airfoil did I choose and what pitching moment curve does it have. So, so now we understand that uh, pitching moment uh, coefficient is important, uh, and it is something we can control in the design. We can select airfoils that have better behaved pitching moment coefficients, but in most cases we're probably going to ignore it because it's a secondary factor and there are other factors of why we chose that airfoil that are much more important. So it's an avenue to look at, it's a thing to look at, but it may not be the key that unlocks the door to getting rid of the problem. Um, as far as air elasticity, we can deal with that. We can stiffen our wings as much as possible, and I'm using those pultruded carbon fiber strips, which have incredible stiffness uh, to, in an attempt to make my wings as stiff as possible. And they're very lightweight, and if I have to, later on, if I have too much flexibility in my wing, I can go in and add more of those. I could literally just bond them on on the outside of the wing, ferro them in, mess up the airfoil a little bit, but I don't care about that if I need a stiffer wing. And I, I could play with that problem by adding more of those carbon fiber strips for, you know, for a pound or two, I could make the wing much, much stiffer. Uh, and then if I like that, then I go back and build another set of wing panels where those, uh, the additional carbon fiber strips are on the inside. So uh, that is something that we have control over and we can play with. Now, how do I determine whether my wing is stiff enough or not ahead of time? And guys will write in and say, what equation did you use to calculate the stiffness of your wing? And I'm going to have to give them the answer. I give them many times. I didn't. Uh, I've done nothing to calculate uh, in terms mathematically the stiffness of my wing. We did load testing, and I've and I stood there and I looked and it says, oh, the wings, oh, geez, we got 1,200 pounds of bags on there, and the wings only deflected maybe two or three inches. That thing's really, really stiff. Um, and uh, if it hadn't been stiff enough when we did that load testing, I would have put in more of the carbon fiber strips and stiffened it up. So, generally speaking, once you have the wings strong enough to take your static bending loads, it's probably stiff enough for ultralight aircraft. Now, that doesn't include special circumstances like VNE. Uh, you may need to increase the strength of your wing and the stiffness of the wing 
to increase your VNE. In other words, your max airspeed where you can do a maximum control deflection and not rip the wings off. That's an entirely separate problem. Um, so, okay, stiffness of the wing we can play with, airfoil we can play with. Airfoil, we're probably not going to choose to make any changes. Stiffness, well, we got it strong enough already, it's probably stiff enough, and we can change it later if we have to. So now we're down to the last one, and we're down to mass distributions. What can I do with my wing relative to mass distributions to make it harder to perturb the aircraft to start with? And uh, the reason I ended up at this parameter is because I was sitting around thinking about this problem, and I've thought about this pecking problem for years. And I thought, you know, no, it dawns on me. Geez, nobody, nobody, nobody in the flex wing world, you go out and go out with the hang divers in the flex wing world, and guys don't sit around saying, that design has too much pecking on it, it's terrible to fly, I would never buy one. And somebody over here says, I've never had pecking in a car on my, they don't even talk about it. It's not even a topic of discussion, never comes up. You could probably ask 10 hang glider pilots if their wing has ever done any pecking. And they go, peck what? They wouldn't even know what the topic is. It's not a topic of discussion. It's not something to get it. So all of a sudden I realized, I realized flex wings don't peck. How can that be? How can, and, and the book that I showed you earlier, Design of Flying Wings says, Pecking occurs on some designs and not on others, but we don't know why. It's like, oh, here's a whole class of aircraft that appear to not have a problem with pecking. They fly nice. They fly fantastic. They're, some of them are a joy to fly. Hmm, interesting. Is it because they're flexible? That the fabric flexes in such a way, the airframe flexes in such a way that as soon as they're perturbed in pitch, that the whole thing flexes and damps it out? That could be could easily be the answer. And uh, how do you do that on a flying wing? How do I create a flying wing that automatically adjusts its shape based on the loads that are imparted on it, such as to damp out the pecking? Oh, it's a rigid wing. And it's an oxymoron. How do I make a rigid wing flexible? Well, I don't want to make it flexible. I'm building a rigid wing. So that one's out. Uh, that is not a path for solution. Uh, because you're just going to end up back at a flex wing, and we've got lots of those already. So how do I make a rigid wing pecking motion? Interesting thought. Well, what's the difference? What are other differences between a flex wing and a rigid wing? What do I see that's different about them? And uh, let's look at that right now. Let's see what the arrangement is of a flex wing on its mass distributions. And this is important on ultralight aircraft. And it's special to ultralight aircraft. It doesn't occur on other types of aircraft. And that is, and let me pull you in a little bit closer here. Here's a typical flex wing setup. I got my airfoil, which in this case is gigantic, so I could ride on it. And when it moves, when it moves dynamically, it's got some pivot point that's somewhere close to the control bar here. Uh, the control bar comes down, sometimes forward like this. And here's the hang strap for the pilot. And because I don't care about pilots, I just drew him as one big dot. He weighs 180 pounds. And here's his little arms coming forward, and he grabs that control bar. And the wing weighs 80 pounds. Well, the first thing I notice is, wow, what a huge difference. Most aircraft in the world, the payload is a tiny fraction of the weight of the entire aircraft. Think of the B-2 bomber, the Northrop flying wing. Tons and tons of weight. And the payload that goes inside? Small fraction. Not so with hang gliders, other flex wings, other ultralight aircraft. Sometimes the aircraft actually weighs less than the pilot. So where you put the pilot becomes a major driver on the mass distribution of the entire system. And when we talk dynamics, we have to talk the entire system. The pilot is really critical because he's the majority of the mass of the vehicle. Here I am flying along at 200 and 60 pounds total, and 180 pounds is the pilot. Oh, there's a parameter I can play with. I can put everybody on a diet. Oh, that's not a workable solution. I can have everybody carry ballast. There's a solution you could do. You'd say, if you don't weigh 150 pounds, you better put some lead in your harness so that you weigh 150 pounds, because I need that much mass hanging down here. You could do that. Most people wouldn't like it. So here I'm lugging around 20 pounds of lead in my harness. Don't want to do that. 
Ah, I can extend the pilot further down. That changes his moment arm. And think of what happens here. In this particular system, as soon as the aircraft goes to pitch like this, it's trying to lift the pilot up here higher. And you've got this mass that's up high that wants to swing back down here to where it was before. It wants to be at its lowest energy level, which is hanging vertically below the aircraft. And likewise, going this way, pitches up, pilot's up here. So, and that's quite often called the pendulum effect. Pilot's hanging down here, and he's providing a pendulum effect that is stabilizing for this aircraft because the weight is hanging below the pivot point, and that stabilizes the aircraft. So now when a gust comes along, I better get my other pen here so I don't have a permanent mark on my board. Get my other pen. Okay, so you come along, and I got a characteristic length of turbulence here and a big amplitude, and it hits the nose and goes pow, pushes that nose up. Now, the... The more weight that I have down here, the further that it's down, the higher the amplitude of this turbulence I need in order to perturb the aircraft significantly. So this has a significant damping effect relative to perturbing the aircraft. Will it damp it out? Once I get that pilot up at an angle or up over here, well, then you really do have a pendulum. It's swinging back and forth. And you know as well as I do, once you get a pendulum going, if it's heavy, pretty hard to stop it. So the inherent damping forces that you have at work in this configuration can be overpowered by the dynamics of this weight swinging back and forth. So the weight hanging down low helps prevent the initial perturbation, but it doesn't necessarily help. It might actually hinder the damping of any dynamic motion going on in pitch. So it'll prevent the pecking from getting started, but if it does get started, it's probably not going to help damp it out. Then I had to think about this some more and, and think about, well, gosh, the, the flex wings should be having problems in certain circumstances, but they're not. Nobody complains about it. Nobody says anything. And why is that? Huh. And let's see, what else do I know about pecking? Happened on the SB-13. Happened in some of the Horton designs. Early ones, no. Happened on their, uh, the Horton 15. Uh, I'll put up a picture later when we talk about that one. Uh, happened on my wing, uh, and I heard that it can happen on the Swift and maybe on the Millennium. I'm not sure about that, but anybody who's a Swift or Millennium pilot, if you've ever had pecking occur, uh, put something in the comments and say yay or nay on the pecking thing and how much of a problem it was for you. Uh, so, hmm, what's the difference? Okay, the Swift and the Millennium have the pilot below the wing. In my wing, I was sitting in the middle of the wing. I'll put up a picture of that. You can see where I'm sitting in the wing. The SB-13 had a picture earlier. I'll put it back up again here. Oh, the pilot's sitting above the wing. Oh, the mass of the pilot is actually up here. Yeah. A worse problem. When the pilot moves down, oh, it actually makes the situation worse. Or this way. The pilot is inherently unstable relative to this issue here. He wants to go down around the other way because he's above that pivot point. Not much. His butt is sitting like right on the pivot point or just aft of it. So it's not a big factor, but it is a factor. Uh, my wing, I'm sitting right in the middle. I'm right here at the pivot point. When I experienced pecking, I didn't move at all. The wing just oscillated around me. It was real weird to see. It was like, oh, well, that's a little spooky. Uh, but I didn't move an inch. Sat right where I was, I'm on my hang straps, and the wing goes doop, doop, doop. If the Swift or something like that is pecking, well then, the, the pilot on the Swift is very close to the bottom of the wing. You know, he's got his head up here, body comes down here. Like, he sits really close. So his center of mass is not that far below the wing. Not nearly as far below the wing as a flex wing aircraft. Flex wing pilot's much lower down. Hmm, wonder if that's part of it. If the Swift has ever experienced pecking and flex wings don't, maybe that's part of it. Maybe it has to do with how low you hang the pilot. Can I change how low I hang the pilot? Yeah, that's something I can definitely control. I can control the length of my cage, pilot's cage, and change the position of the pilot and make it as far away from the wing as possible. Now, as I do that, I increase the surface area of my cockpit, the height of it, and the weight of it. So I'm increasing drag and I'm increasing weight. But what I'm buying is uh, more prevention of pecking by 
uh, not allowing it to get perturbed in the first place because I'm putting the majority of my mass down as low as possible. Okay. And then as I was thinking through this whole problem, I thought, oh, it's a dynamic system. Gee, Raul, stop and think. You're talking dynamics. So let's get rid of all this other stuff. We're talking about dynamic stability, and we've got to talk about things that move. And the pilot is not rigidly connected to the control bar. It's his arms. And his arms, we draw them in the dynamic stability world, we would have to draw them like this. If my pen will work. Ah, I got skin oil on there. You can barely see it. They're a spring. The pilot's arms are a spring. They are movable. They go in and out like this. And that's a spring. Or if you prefer a hydraulic damper. Our arms are mostly water. We have muscles in them. And they act just like shock absorbers. Oh. There's another dynamic factor here. This spring constant here, some spring constant, I don't know what the right notation is, but I'll call it a S sub C. It's a spring constant. And that varies by pilot. Some pilots have more muscles. Some pilots have fast muscles. Some have slow muscles. But it is potentially a huge contributor to damping. I thought, oh, we got two gigantic hydraulic dampers on every flex wing out there called the pilot's arms. If he's flying one-handed, okay, you only have one damper. But generally speaking, we got two really powerful hydraulic dampers. And not only that, here's the best part. They're computer controlled. And you say, what computer? This one right here. It's a natural reaction. As you, we learn to fly, we learn to sense what the aircraft is telling us. And our tendency is to want to keep that control bar right where it is. We don't want that control bar whipping around. And if you talk to guys that have flown in heavy turbulence, that's when they talk, start talking about how nice it is to fly one flex wing over another. I flew for 20 minutes in turbulence and I was absolutely exhausted and my arms turned to jello. Well, that's why. They're out there damping out all of these effects. And they're damping it without knowing it because their brain is just flying the aircraft. So we have, on every flex wing, we have computer-controlled hydraulic dampers. Pretty cool. Did they design flex wings to have two uh, computer-controlled hydraulic dampers? No. It just came about in the evolution of flex wings. But it's one of the things that makes them really, really stable, especially dynamically. The lighter the pilot, the less the effect. The heavier the pilot, the stronger the muscles, the greater the effect. The slower the brain, the less effect. The faster the brain, the better. So uh, a skinny old guy who's got a really slow brain, not as effective as the fat uh, young guy who's really fast. So there we go. Now, let's look at the Horton design that had problems. It's the Horton 15. Put a picture up here. Oh my gosh, look. It's a two-seater. One pilot is sitting in the wing. Another is sitting above the wing. Their mass distribution is uh, not helpful in terms of pecking. It actually is going to assist in the initial perturbation of the pecking, and it's not going to help in terms of damping it out. And let's take a look at the SB-13. Well, we took a look at the SB-13. We already talked about that, the pilot sitting above the wing. That is a non-helpful location. Uh, and we look at the Swift, the pilot. We looked at that. The pilot's below the wing, but they try to keep them in really close to keep the drag cut down. So what am I doing? I'm putting the pilot as far as I can below the wing to get my mass down there. And here's the other thing that I'm doing. The Swift and the Millennium have the pilot attached to the pilot's cage, which just seems totally logical. The frame is right there. The seat's there. Hook the seat into the frame and sit on the seat. Then you lose this system. Now you got a mass down here. You know, once again, I got my skin oil. You got a mass down here that is now rigidly connected in with the airframe. And here's the difference. With flex wings, the majority of the mass is decoupled from the airframe. And the coupling between that mass and the airframe is via hydraulic dampers. For the Swift and the Millennium, there is a bit of a damper, but you kind of got to scoot yourself forward in the seat and scoot yourself back. And you can't do that fast enough. And you're, yeah, you are holding on the control stick and the other hand's on the other side of the pilot's cage, but you can't react fast enough to damp out 
any dynamic event like pecking. So what I've done is I have a pilot's cage that looks like a Swift or a Millennium, but I've suspended the pilot from the wing like this. And I am free to swing in my pilot's cage. So I am going to use the hydraulic dampers that I have, one on the control stick, one on the other side of the pilot's cage, to do the thing that you do on a flex wing, provide that hydraulic damping to counteract any perturbations in pitch and damp them out quickly before they get out of hand. Now, that won't be as effective as the control bar situation, uh, just because I got one hand on the stick and I can't, I can't push on the stick. In fact, people that I've described this to have said, are you going to excite the problem? Because as you go to adjust your weight swinging back and forth, you're going to move the stick. And I says, that could be a problem. And I might have to put a damper on the stick. I might have to do something else. I might have to train myself to do the hydraulic damping with my left arm only. I don't know. But it is part of the answer. Where you put the pilot, the weight of the aircraft, compared to the weight of the pilot, and where you put the pilot or pilots, makes a big difference on this whole thing. It's a driver. It can help prevent the perturbation, and if you leave that mass free to swing and put in some hydraulic dampers, you could actually create a system that allows the pilot to rapidly damp out any pecking motion that tries to get started. And I think that's what happens with most flex wings. I've gone on YouTube and looked at videos of, uh, search for videos of flex wings flying in turbulence, and I've watched them very closely and run them in slow motion and analyzed them. And indeed, if you see a flex wing flying in turbulence, they're pitching all over the place, or they're trying to. And you see the pilot working like crazy. His arms are going like this, back and forth. And sometimes they take a beating. If you've ever flown a flex wing, you can feel it sometimes. If you're in tight turbulence, it just beats your arms like this. And those hydraulic dampers are working full time. And it can be exhausting. But that's why they don't experience the pecking. It's trying to get started, but the dynamics built into the system are preventing it from uh, occurring to the point where the pilot would notice it. And then there's the other factor. When you're sitting in the middle of your wing and it goes like this, you see that immediately. If your wing's overhead and you, you only see the nose if you look up and generally you're looking ahead where you're flying, well, if the wing starts pecking, you might not see that at all. If you're suspended below the wing and the wing does this and you're looking that way, you might not ever see it. Uh, because it's not a motion that's going to impart a force on you other than the control bar, which you're controlling anyway, and you're trying to damp out all those oscillations. So that's why flex wings work so well, uh, and that's potentially why some uh, rigid wing uh, gliders and maybe other uh, types of ultralight aircraft, especially flying wings, have a problem. They're lightly damped relative to the pitching moment curve of the airfoil, and by placing the pilot in or above the wing, um, it uh, becomes an issue if the airframe is light. Now, you might have a powered ultralight, like a Mitchell B-10, uh, and that aircraft, by the time you add the engine and the undercarriage and a heavier pilot's cage and all that other stuff, now the mass of the aircraft is starting to get up there to where it's more than the weight of the pilot. And that's an entirely different scenario. There you can move the pilot around, maybe have him fixed in place rather than swinging, and you don't have a problem. But you go look at something like the, uh, uh, I forget the name of it right now, uh, the Casper wing. Uh, the Casper wing, uh, flying wing, uh, pilot's suspended below the wing, but he's free to swing, fore and aft. In fact, they do their pitch control by the pilot pitching himself, and they do roll control with drag rudders. Uh, and it's a non-issue. Same thing was uh, true of the Icarus II, the Icarus V. Uh, Tars Kassenik designed those so that the pilot was suspended much like a regular uh, hang glider pilot because he was using weight shift for control and had to move the pilot. So the only time you end up locking the pilot in place is when you put in elevons and you give them a side stick for controlling pitch instead of weight shift. Now, I'm not going to use weight shift for pitch control. I do use it for pitch trim but not for pitch control, but I'm also going to use weight shift for pitch damping and hopefully prevent the pecking from occurring. So there we go. That's a basic analysis of this pecking problem. Um, uh, I think the authors are long gone for that book, so they won't have to go back and do uh, an adjustment and another edition of the book. But I've given you some hints and tips on how you can do your own designs to help prevent the pecking problem. And I would say in general, uh, if you have a lightweight airframe, 
don't put the pilot above the wing. Make sure the pilot's below the wing and allow him to swing freely and create some system where the pilot can hang out and provide some hydraulic damping. The other option that we're very close to, and uh, if I'm around long enough to do one, I'll do a flying wing that has fly-by-wire. And then we can put in real computer-controlled dampers in the system, uh, do it like they do on the F-117 and the B-2 bomber and many other unstable uh, military aircraft, and then the pilot won't have to worry about it at all, and we'll never see it occur because those systems would be fast enough to stop that pecking uh, before it gets to the point where the pilot would even notice. Uh, and uh, that's the really best solution. In fact, my current wing, I, I actually did some looking into fly-by-wire for this wing, and it's still a little bit too heavy, uh, but those systems are coming along rapidly. And soon enough here, 10 years, we're going to be, maybe less, we're going to be at a point where these can be fly-by-wire, and then we can build in those uh, automated control systems. And then you're going to see a big boost in performance in flying wings, uh, because we're going to actually be able to fly them in both uh, st static and dynamically unstable configurations, uh, and then apply uh, algorithms uh, and put a computer on board and control them that way. And then the pilot just generally points the aircraft and the computer keeps it stable. Uh, and we'll get more performance in the long run that way. So I hope uh, this helps uh, uh, expose an uh, interesting and oft-debated topic in such a way that people think about it a little bit differently and a little more in depth. If you're working on a flying wing design, I admonish you to don't stop at static stability. You have gotta be looking at all your dynamic stability too because the safety of that aircraft is highly dependent upon it. And if you're doing ultralight aircraft, very much so, pay attention to where you put the pilot. And uh, so lightweight flying wing, pay close attention to where you put the pilot to avoid problems uh, in the future, ending up with an aircraft that's just uh, ugly to fly. So uh, hope it was fun. Uh, another long video, but it's hard to get into these complex topics without rambling on. Uh, once again, if you like a hat, uh, go to the link below, and the PayPal link, and send me 20 bucks for a hat. Uh, if you'd like to get the uh, X-Plane Simulator for my flying wing, that's 15 bucks uh, package deal. Uh, you get both of them, $30. Send me that money at PayPal uh, at rawclane uh, at gmail.com, and I'll send them right back to you. Uh, make sure you include a mailing address for the hat. Um, and uh, if you have a mind to, and you believe that you're getting educated here, and you feel that you should actually fork over a couple of bucks for that education, you would go over to Patreon, become one of my patrons, and over at Patreon, you become a patron, and you get the, uh, the merch for free, uh, and, and uh, my eternal thanks for becoming a patron. So check out those links, and at the very least, if you're not a subscriber, hit the subscribe button, and come back and watch all my other videos. And in the meantime, fly safe. Bye for now.